Cool. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to be joined today by Israel Policy Forum's Policy Director, Michael Koplau, who will be talking about the new report from the Center for New American Security he co-authored, which outlines how the new Biden administration ought to approach the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I'll put a link for the study in the chat in a second so that you guys can check it out if you haven't yet. But before we jump in, I have a few pre-event reminders to share. Since this is a more intimate briefing, we encourage you to be active participants in the conversation. Uh, we're gonna have a Q&A session about halfway through the, uh, the program. So once we get to that point, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions when you feel it is appropriate. Um, you're also, of course, welcome to make use of the chat feature and the raise hand feature. Uh, but just in general, please be cur courteous of others on the call. And if you've spoken a lot, remember to step back to allow others to the chance to participate. Uh, we scheduled this call for an hour and 15 minutes. Michael's presentation will be over at 8 p.m., after which we welcome you to stay on the call for a brief post-event Zoom schmooze. And the way that will work is we're going to pair everyone into random breakout groups of about three people uh, to give you a chance to meet others on the call and to network and debrief what was discussed and just really hang out. Um, and our IPF at uh, our team at IPF is continuing to promote uh, this report through programs and partnerships. And this can include I with IPF chapters, IPF and D chapters, uh, with community organizations you're involved in or with others. So contact us whenever to set something up. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome Michael and turn it over to him. Okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, good, to, good to see everybody. I, I, know, uh, I know most of the people on this call. Um, so good to see lots of uh, lots of lots of friends and lots of familiar faces. Um, so uh, don't worry, I'm not going to actually speak uh, until until eight o'clock. Um, I want to make sure that, uh, especially since this is not only a relatively uh, a relatively small and intimate group, but uh, you know these are all you guys are all steering committee folks. Um, I've had I've had long policy discussions with uh, with lots of you over the years. So. Um, you know, this is also a relatively high level group. So rather than go through every single element in this report, uh, you know, it is a long report. I think, uh, I think it's close to 70 pages if, if memory serves me correctly. Um, although I don't actually know because since it came out during COVID, we never, we never created uh, physical copies. Um, but I think, I think it's about 70 pages. Um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the assumptions that underline the report and I'll, I'll, I'll quickly run through the major things we outline. Um, and then, you know, I hope we can we can have a discussion. I'm as always happy to answer any questions about about anything that anybody has. And um, you know, and I'd love to uh, not only hear people's questions, but just uh, hear people's hear people's general comments and thoughts and uh, what you think we got right, what you think what you think we got wrong. <clears throat> so, um, to begin with, it's important to kind of set the set the background for for this report. So, first of all. Um, my co-authors were Elon Goldenberg and Tammy Wittes. Uh, we had a fourth co-author, uh, Hadi Amr, who had to drop off because he went to the transition. And so he couldn't put his name on this uh, while serving as a transition official. Um, and uh, as uh, this is, this is, it's not proprietary, it's not quite public yet, but, um, but it's okay, okay, I think for me to tell people anyway. Um, as of uh, last Friday, Hattie is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Israeli-Palestinian Affairs. So, um, uh, you know, we have uh, one of one of the four, because there really were four of us. One of the four co-authors of this of this report uh, is now in charge of the Israeli-Palestinian file. Uh, yes, as Adam says, don't tweet out yet. <laughs> but uh, one of the four co-authors of this report is now in charge of the Israeli-Palestinian file at the State Department, uh, and it's even more important because, unlike previous administrations. This administration is not creating a special envoy office for Israel-Palestine. Uh, they may, you know, who knows how what things will look like in four years, but as of now, they aren't. And, and what that means is that um, Hattie's office at state really is is the uh, the office for for this issue. So it's great. And if anybody saw the remarks delivered at the UN today by the acting uh, the acting ambassador to the United Nations, uh, there was a series of remarks on the Biden administration's approach to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, and if you read those remarks, uh, as, you'll hear, uh, as you'll hear when I'm done in about 30 minutes, um, they, sound, uh, <laughs> they sound eerily like they were drawn from this report. And, uh, and um, while I haven't spoken with Hattie today, uh, that's probably not, uh, probably not a coincidence. So 
we spent over a year writing this thing. I think the first meeting we had, because there was a task force to inform this report too, I think the first task force meeting was either in September or October uh, of, of last year. Um, I'm sorry, not of, or in 2021, not of last year, in September or October of 2019. Um, so uh, we spent uh, we spent a long time a long time writing this, um, and you know, so first of all, you know, it's important to recognize that um, in our view, you know, this is not going to be a top burner issue. It has been in the past for many administrations. It's not going to be for this one, um, for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, starting with the fact that the Biden folks have their hands full with COVID, with China, with all sorts of things, um, but also because. There is a recognition that um, as much as lots of people want to solve this conflict, it's really not right for solving. And, uh, and so it's not going to be, you know, this is not the Obama administration where you had George Mitchell appointed as a special envoy uh, in the first week. Um, that is simply something that is, that is, that is not going to happen. Um, and so the context, you know, just the context for this on the US side, I think is different than it has been uh, in, previous, in previous administrations. Um, in addition, you know, the conflict itself, as, as everybody here, I think, probably, you know, certainly understands and, and probably agrees with um, for a variety of reasons. As I said, it's, it's not right for any type of negotiation or, or resolution at the moment. Um, you know, the, the number, number of settlers and the amount of Israeli construction um, in the West Bank, uh, you know, is, uh, is at record levels, um, you know, and has basically increased with, with nearly every successive administration. Um, the Palestinians are still split between Fatah and Hamas. Uh, yes, they have announced elections, but um, I'm, not, I'm not optimistic those will happen. Uh, aside from the split, the fact is that the PA is uh, not democratic, um, extremely corrupt, non-transparent. Um, Gaza is run by uh, a, terrorist, a terrorist organization. Uh, the inequality between the Israeli and Palestinian sides um, you know, also makes things very difficult. You know, the, the kind of easiest number to grasp for this is that uh, GDP per capita in Israel is 10 times what it is in the West Bank, and it's 20 times what it is in Gaza, um, which in itself creates all sorts of power imbalances and inequities. Um, and on both sides, you know, support for two states, while it is still a plurality on both sides, um, is at its lowest levels on both sides since Austin. Um, and that includes during, during the second intifada. So, you know, there are all sorts of trends here that, um, that make it difficult to, to really talk about any type of negotiated, negotiated outcome. Um, in addition, US policy has failed. And this isn't simply a function of the Trump administration, you know, with, with which um, certainly I and, and my co-authors have all sorts of, all sorts of critiques. Uh, this, this wasn't really working before the Trump administration either. Um, the Obama administration, uh, made all sorts of missteps and ultimately was not able to get the two sides any closer together. The same goes for the uh, W. Bush administration. The same goes for uh, the Clinton administration, which you know obviously um, was there for Oslo. I wouldn't say oversaw Oslo because that really happened kind of outside of outside of uh, U.S. the U.S.'s uh, U.S.'s purview until the end. Um, but you know, President Clinton tried very hard at Camp David and. It didn't work and resulted in the second intifada. This is this is not something um, that any of us are are laying uh, simply at the feet of the Trump administration. U.S. policy on this has been broken, uh, or if not broken, certainly ineffective, for a long time. Uh, and what has happened is that as the U.S. has failed to make any progress, and as Israelis and Palestinians have really grown farther apart in terms of their positions on how to resolve the conflict, um, you know, things on the ground have have gotten worse, and so. The, the sort of the, the thesis statement to the extent there is one of this of this report um, is that focusing on high profile diplomatic initiatives at the moment is 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 a bad move. It's bad policy. It's the wrong way to go. Um, a because it won't be successful, and B because when you focus on high profile diplomatic initiatives, what has tended to happen is that everything else gets ignored, and so the actual day to day for both sides uh, in different ways gets worse while we sort of brush things to the side and overlook all sorts of things and, and just go for that ultimate deal um, that is really at the moment not attainable. And so, you know, what we're really calling for is, is for the United States to take tangible steps, um, both on the ground and, and diplomatically, uh, to do a bunch of things. Um, first and foremost, uh, to create, uh, create and secure stability um, and prevent conflict 
not only for uh, the people living uh, in Israel and Palestine, but for US partners. Second, to promote freedom, security, and prosperity for everybody living between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, both now and in the event of a final status agreement down the road. And third, preserve and advance uh, the idea of a negotiated two-state outcome um, and do things to, to lay the groundwork for that to eventually uh, be achievable. And so with those three objectives, we basically have three buckets in this report that, we, that we're recommending and I'll, and I'll run through some of the policies uh, in, in each of them. Um, the first is kind of the, the near term um, to really deal with pressing issues that, um, that threaten to make conflict more likely um, in, the, in the near term, um, deal with any, any issues that, uh, that are immediately threatening to a two-state outcome, um, deal with any issues that are you know, today preventing basic freedom, security, and prosperity for Israelis and Palestinians. Um, next is the medium term. Uh, and this is really where we kind of dig into, you know, think about kind of after six months to a year, the US government really focusing on issues um, to improve freedom, security, and prosperity, and to lay the groundwork for two states. Uh, and then third, um, and this one is important, but, but maybe of, uh, maybe of a, a bit uh, less interest because this, this focuses much more on kind of the weeds of US government functions, um, just reshape how the US deals with this conflict, both in terms of US government organization. Um, and I'll note that uh, one of the things that we recommended in here uh, was that the U.S. should not create a special envoy office for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in this administration. Um, so they, uh, they seem to have uh, taken that advice. Um, I don't know whether they got it from us or not, but uh, we'll take credit for it anyway. Um, reshape the U.S. government role, uh, both in terms of the U.S. government structure itself and kind of who, who deals with policy on this conflict, and also how the U.S. engages with the rest of the world um, and trying to get to a place where the US does not crowd out um, pretty much every other actor uh, in this sphere. And, and that is something that historically um, has happened. The US has basically come in and kind of shut everybody else out. And we don't think that that is, uh, for a variety of reasons, we don't think that, that is a good, uh, a good idea either. So, um, so those are kind of the three, the three buckets. So you know, I'll, go through, uh, I'll go through these one by one. Um, so, you know, the first bucket, which is, as I said, kind of the, the immediate term and, and really addressing any big issues that, that uh, threaten progress, that um, threaten changes on the ground right now. So, um, and these aren't, by the way, laid out in, in sort of order of priority. They're, they're, the, the, order is, the order is kind of, kind of random. Um, but I'll start with uh, the one that happens to be first is actually a good one to start with because uh, as I said, um, the, the acting ambassador to the UN gave a series of remarks today um, where he basically uh, backed up what I'm about to say, which is number one, um, laying out, returning, I should say, to a bunch of core principles um, that the US uh, has held for decades that the Trump administration um, in, in different ways either downplayed or threw out entirely. Um, and those principles are, you know, Negotiations being the basis for conflict resolution, meaning that uh, we don't think anybody should be imposing a solution on this conflict. Um, you know, and that includes, uh, that certainly includes Israel trying to, uh, through annexation, um, impose, uh, impose its own borders and, and impose some sort of uh, final status on the conflict uh, that is not negotiated between the two sides. Um, supporting freedom, security, and prosperity for for everybody right now, basically improving the situation on the ground, again, out of recognition that negotiations right now simply will not work, um, and making sure that uh, the US is clear that it still supports a two-state outcome, which is something that the Trump administration certainly talked about in the context of uh, the Trump Peace to Prosperity Plan, um, but didn't really support in, in practice. Um, and uh, you know, the the Acting ambassador to uh, to the United Nations today, um, you know, talked about uh, you know he, he talked he talked about these uh, in some ways in, in almost identical language and in some ways uh, with a different uh, with a different spin. Um, but if you read what he said today, 
Um, you know, what he said was under President Biden, the policy of the US will be to support a mutually agreed two state solution. Um, uh, he talked about the fact that because the leader, leaderships are far apart on these issues, um, that uh, the US and other member states of the UN still have a responsibility to not only preserve the viability of two states, uh, but to improve conditions on the ground and, and particularly, particularly in Gaza, and that uh, the US is, um, the US is uh, going to remain opposed to unilateral steps that make two states more difficult, um, such as annexation, such as increased settlements, uh, such as uh, incitement to violence, such, such as uh, Palestinian compensation uh, for people who have been imprisoned for acts of terrorism. Um, all these are in the report, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to them as well. But the point is, you know, this is the framework that, uh, that the Biden administration appears to be uh, to be embracing. Um, so, aside from laying out these core principles up front to kind of give everybody a sense, you know, throughout, not just Israelis and Palestinians, but throughout the world, you know, what US policy is going to be um, over the next four years. Some of the specific steps that we talk about in the report are uh, reopening the Consulate General in Jerusalem, um, something else that uh, was talked about at the UN today. Um, you know, for those who aren't familiar with this issue, this is, sounds like something small, but it's actually very important. Uh, in, in 2018, the United States closed its consulate in Jerusalem and merged it into the US Embassy. Um, the consulate in Jerusalem had been essentially a separate diplomatic mission to the Palestinians. The consul general reported directly back to the State Department in DC and, and not to the ambassador. Um, and once uh, the consulate general was closed and merged into the embassy, um, A, Palestinians stopped engaging with the US consular services almost entirely because um, they did not want to have to go through the embassy and they didn't want to be treated as simply an outgrowth of Israel. Uh, and B, it sent a really bad message with regards to states because when you're saying to the Palestinians, we are only going to deal with you through the context of the ambassador to Israel. Remember, the, the ambassador to Israel did not then get you know, the increased title of ambassador to Israel, the West Bank and Gaza. Um, so when you say to the Palestinians, you know, you, you, we are dealing with you uh, through our represent representation to Israel and you know, we're only going to have one address for everybody. Um, that is as clear of a backing for one state as exists. So, you know, just from, you know, leaving the logistics of it aside, uh, it's really critical to reopen the conflict general, just from an optics perspective to, to resend the message that we're committed to two states. Um, we also call on the report for reopening the PLO mission in DC, which the Trump administration closed as well. Um, you know, I'll tell you that that one is almost, um, if it happens, it's going to take years. That's, that's actually not a very easy fix as a result of congressional legislation um, that, makes it, uh, that makes it difficult to reopen it, as opposed to the Consulate General which, um, in Jerusalem, which there are some hurdles, but it's, but it's far easier. Uh, but we do call for the PLO mission in DC to be reopened as well. Uh, we call for uh, resuming humanitarian assistance to the West Bank and Gaza, uh, which includes assistance that goes to UNRWA. Um, you know, particularly on the humanitarian side and particularly in Gaza, there simply is no other way to do this. Um, the US is not well placed to provide this humanitarian assistance directly um, and no other party is no other party is either. Um, and also because of US legislation, um, you know, where we can't spend any money that directly benefits the Palestinian Authority, uh, one of the quickest and kind of simplest ways to restore humanitarian assistance is to, is to run it through UNRWA. Um, you know, irrespective of, and you know, I'm happy to talk about this too, you know, if people want to delve into it more, you know, certainly there are problems with UNRWA, but, um, you know, once you're talking about uh, getting humanitarian, humanitarian assistance restarted, there really is no, there really is no other address at the moment. Um, you know, we also would like to see uh, a focus on just improving quality of life um, in the West Bank, but particularly in Gaza, uh, in terms of freedom of movement, in terms of electricity, uh, water, kind of delve into all these issues in, in pretty, pretty good depth in the report. Um, reforming uh, the Palestinian prisoner payments and martyr payment system is critical. Um, it's critical, A, because in a lot of ways that is actually what has to happen in order to remove or amend legislation that prevents opening the PLO mission in DC. But, you know, <laughs> more importantly, it's, it's a real issue. Um, it's something that, you know, is not only a big issue for the US Congress, you know, the Taylor Force Act, which was directed at, uh, at martyr payments, passed with enormous bipartisan support. Um, it's a real ongoing issue for the Israeli government and for Israelis. And 
you know, it's something that um, we at IPF, you know, now putting my IPF hat on for a second, you know, we've never swept under the table um, and it shouldn't be swept under the table. And uh, it's really critical for the Palestinians and they are, they finally do, I think, understand this. Um, it's critical for them to address this. Um, it's critical just from the, for the message it sends and it's critical um, because of the actual uh, substantive ramifications of keeping the policy in place. So, um, you know, it is important that that, 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 that get reformed and that, and that that get addressed early on. Um, you know, we also call for uh, making it clear that the U.S. is not going to support any annexation of the West Bank. Um, and we also uh, make it clear that the U.S. should set some early red lines um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to settlements. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean demanding a full settlement freeze. The Obama administration tried that and it didn't work. And you know, all of us uh, who co-authored this report are of the view that um, that was that was a mistake. Um, but it does mean telling the Israeli government that you know, we do have serious problems with uh, settlement construction in particularly sensitive places like Yivat Hamatos, which um, unfortunately is advancing pretty quickly, like E1 and other places that really would um, be enormously damaging to, uh, to getting to a, a two-state outcome. Um, and then, uh, you know, and some of this, uh, some of this falls under that first bucket as well in terms of core principles, but reaffirming some just very basic previous U.S. parameters uh, on borders, security, refugees, and, and Jerusalem, stressing that, um, you know, these are going to have to be negotiated between the two sides, but that the U.S. does support um, an independent Palestinian state on the 67 lines uh, plus land swaps that, uh, that the U.S. does support um, very strict restrictions on, uh, on Palestinian militarization for Israeli security purposes, that the U.S. does support finding some sort of uh, just solution to the refugee problem, um, and that the U.S. does envision eventually uh, Jerusalem as being the capital of two states. Not putting out, you know, <laughs> Not putting out a, 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 a U.S. peace plan like the Trump administration did, and not trying to get the two sides back to negotiations, but just putting the U.S. back on record that these traditional parameters that were the U.S. position under President Clinton, under President Bush, under President Obama, um, are positions uh, to which the U.S. is returning. So, um, you know, this is sort of the basic outline for the the short-term steps. Um, then we move to bucket number two, which is medium-term steps. To preserve the viability of two states, and you know, again, these are things that um, would be great to see progress on, but you know, they come after addressing uh, these first immediate problems that I already talked about. So, um, you know, and these are really almost all aimed, uh, as I said earlier, at, at, at this principle of improving freedom, security, and prosperity for both sides, uh, and really trying to lay the groundwork for two states. So, um, the first is just to expand Palestinian rights in the West Bank. Um, you know, and this goes across across area areas A, B, and C. Um, you know, in much of the only difference between area A and area B, because uh, the Palestinians have administrative control in both of both of both A and B. The difference is that in area B, uh, Israel has security control. Um, but you know, and, and probably many of you have heard me talk about this before. You know, because there are no Israelis living in area B, um, and because the PA has administrative sovereignty there. When we talk about Israeli security control in B, the Israelis, understandably, really only care about security in, in so much as, as it impacts Israelis. Um, they're not there to do basic policing. Um, and as I said, that's understandable, but there are also a million Palestinians living in Area B and zero Israelis. And so when you have full security control there, but you don't actually care about policing, you only care about um, things like counterterrorism, you know, it, it just creates uh, a huge problem and also enormous inequities for the Palestinians who are living in Area B. So, you know, there, there are different ways to solve this. Um, probably almost all of Area B, you know, really could be turned into Area A. Um, even if you didn't want to do that, there are ways, and, and um, IPF has put out uh, independent reports on this, um, there are ways to uh, allow Palestinian police to move much more freely through Area B so that you can provide uh, regular policing to almost all the Palestinians living there. But you know, the point is working to, uh, working to alleviate some of these issues. And then particularly in Area C, you know, where is Israel has full control, uh, but you still have 300,000 300, Palestinians who live there, you know, 
Area C has, has a bunch of real problems. Um, to my mind, the biggest one uh, is the permitting and demolition system where Palestinians simply do not get permits uh, from uh, the IDF to build in Area C. Um, when I say they do not get permits, you know, it's on the scale of um, there has not been one year since 2009 where uh, the Israeli government granted even double digit permits to Palestinians to build uh, in Area C. Um, across 2014, 15, and 16, the last three years of the Obama administration, a grand total of one permit, one building permit in three years was given to Palestinians in Area C. Um, in 2019, uh, the Israeli government announced that it was approving hundreds of permits, uh, building permits in Area C for Palestinians, um, largely to offset uh, a huge number of plans uh, for Israelis that they approved uh, in Area C. Uh, it turns out that a year and a half later, um, the estimates are that I think of those, uh, it was something like 700 permits they announced they were going to approve. Uh, it turns out that um, that uh, fewer than 20 actually uh, actually were granted. Um, actually, I think the number might have been might have been. They're not sure if it's either nine or 17 off the top of my head. Um, the point being that it's impossible functionally uh, to get a permit if you're a Palestinian in Area C. Um, and what happens is that all of those structures that Palestinians then build anyway, because they can't get permits, have demolition orders on them. And so you have, uh, at this point, um, at the moment, just north of 11,000 active demolition permits on Palestinian structures in Area C that uh, impact almost 200,000 Palestinians. That obviously, you know, cannot and should not continue. So, you know, that's really one of the, the biggest reforms, you know, we call for it in the report, we don't kind of stress it more than any other, more than anything else. But if you were to ask me, you know, that's kind of um, one of the most important things that really has to be addressed. Um, you know, next, uh, we want to see real reforms within uh, Palestinian governing institutions. You know, it means reforming uh, accountability and transparency and corruption, which are big problems uh, in the PA. Um, it means enabling Palestinian unity through elections. Um, and it means from the US perspective, not standing in the way of Palestinian elections if they manage to pull them off. You know, right now the Palestinians, uh, two weeks ago, they announced a plan for elections where uh, it's gonna be in three rounds. First, there's gonna be Palestinian legislative council elections. Uh, then you're gonna have uh, presidential elections. And then finally, you're gonna have uh, Palestinian national council elections, which is the, which is the PLO. Um, I am, <laughs> I'm very confident that, um, that we are not going to see all three rounds of elections. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that we're even gonna see the first one. Um, but in the past, the US has uh, in some ways acted as a break when Palestinians have talked about elections because we're still kind of burned from supporting Palestinian elections in 2006 uh, and having Hamas win legislative elections. Um, ultimately, you know, Israeli prime ministers, you know, not just the current one who uses this more as an excuse, but uh, you know, Olmert as well, who really was serious about this, um, Israeli prime ministers have talked about the fact that, you know, why should we negotiate with the Palestinians when we're really only negotiating with half of them, right? You, if you're negotiating with Abbas and the West Bank leadership, you're completely leaving out Gaza and, uh, and Hamas. And, you know, that ends up being nearly 50% of the Palestinian population leaving, you know, forget about the fact that it's a, you know, that it's a separate territory. Um, so Palestinian unity is something that, you know, will benefit the Palestinians and ultimately will also benefit, uh, will benefit Israel in terms of there being one unified address for problems and for complaints and for eventually negotiations. Uh, and so, you know, the US shouldn't stand in the way of that. Obviously, there are some rules of the game that have to be, uh, that have to be respected, um, including uh, abiding by any past agreements that the PLO has agreed to and uh, including, um, including uh, uh, abiding by a rule of, uh, of forswearing violence. Um, you know, we don't think that it necessarily means that Hamas has to disarm right away, but they have to agree not to use those guns. Um, but you know, standing in the way of Palestinian unity has not really worked for uh, for the U.S. as a policy, and and you know we want to make sure that if the Palestinians are actually uh, at the point where they can kind of achieve it, uh, that the U.S. does not stand uh, does not stand as a as a barrier. Um, next is tackling the problem of settlements. You know, aside from aside from what I said earlier, kind of putting red lines on, on, the really, uh, on the really most damaging ones. And here, you know, we recognize that there are lots of different approaches. 
we had a task force of about uh, somewhere, I think it was about 40 people, somewhere between 40 and 50 people, other experts um, that we convened as part of this process. And we had, you know, um, probably close to a dozen task force meetings before we actually sat down just the co-authors to write the report. Um, and there were a few issues uh, and ultimately because a lot of these issues, you know, there was just no agreement in the task force. We ultimately issued the report only under our three names, uh, Elon, Tammy, and, and me. Um, initially, our hope at the very beginning was that we could issue this report uh, and have, you know, most of the task force sign on. There were a few very, very contentious issues within the task force that kind of split it in, split it in two. One of them was how to approach settlements. Um, and so what we decided to do, rather than make any absolute recommendations, was to lay out a series of options um, you know, that, uh, that the US, the US could pursue and each of them have pros and cons. And, you know, the, the three basic options kind of in broad categories, um, you know, are, are one, um, ending the practice of, of shielding Israel from international consequences as a result of settlement policies that run contrary to US policies. And so, you know, that's basically the, you break it, you bought it, rule, right? Um, you know, the Israelis say that they want to do what they want in settlements. And we say, we have a different view. We think you should do A, B, and C. And the Israelis say, well, we think we should do X, Y, and Z. So we don't think it's our view to put sanctions on the Israelis or you know, dictate to them, you must do this. Or if you don't do it, we're going to condition assistance. Those are not approaches that any of us uh, advocate for um, or support. But ultimately, if the Israeli government is going to pursue policies that literally run contrary to US policy, then we don't think that um, it's necessarily the US's job to then act as Israel shield against those policies in the UN or other international organizations. And so what that means, and again, this isn't, this isn't a you know, hard and fast recommendation, this is an option, but what it means is that in the UN, continuing to veto any resolutions that are blatant one-sided anti-Israel resolutions, um, and there are plenty of those, um, you know, probably the majority of resolutions in the UN that deal with Israel fall into that category. But when you have a, a fair and relatively balanced resolution, that calls out Israeli settlement activity that also runs contrary to US policy isn't something that should get an automatic veto. Um, and if the, Israelis, if the Israeli government wants to, wants to make the assessment that it is still worth it to pursue a policy on settlements that runs contrary to uh, US policy and they want to, they, and they're, they're willing to kind of live with uh, the consequences of that and everything it entails, then great, that's an Israeli decision. Um, but we don't think that the US needs to continuously go to international institutions and spend lots of time and political capital protecting Israel from policies that actually run contrary to our own ones. So that's option number one. Um, option number two is to pursue a very clearly defined partial settlement freeze. So as I said before, we don't think that the, the full settlement freeze that the Obama administration asked for worked. Um, we do, you know, for a whole lot of reasons, but one of the biggest is that that's just not sustainable in the context of Israeli of Israeli politics. And frankly, it's not even productive in the sense that, you know, there are areas, um, particularly in, in five large blocks along the Green Line, that are going to be part of Israel in a negotiated solution. And so it doesn't really make sense to kind of expend this huge amount of capital and fight with Israelis and say, you've got to freeze building in, um, you know, in, in uh, Gush Etzion when ultimately that's not going to do anything that really erodes uh, a potential two-state outcome. So um, we talked a little bit about, in, we talked a little bit in the report about uh, you know, what we think a partial settlement freeze should look like. Um, you know, it, it's, and it's not just, there, there are some organizations, uh, including our friends at Commanders for Israel Security, um, including the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv, that have talked about a partial settlement freeze beyond the barrier. We actually don't think that's enough. We think that it's important to also focus on places inside the barrier because some of the most sensitive places such as Givat Hamatos uh, or E1 are inside the barrier. So just saying freezing beyond the barrier doesn't work. Um, but really, um, you know, looking at uh, a few key areas, you know, sort of beyond the barrier and some key, key areas inside the barrier and saying, you know, we would like to see a freeze in these areas. You know, build, if you build in other places, doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that we like it, but you know we'll sort of we're not going to make a big deal of it, um, so long as you keep things frozen uh, in places that are really critical to a future state. Um, so that's option number two. Option number three is um, 
effectively doing what the Trump administration did in terms of creating a map and saying, this is, this is a US map. Um, it would not look like the Trump administration's map. Um, and basically using that as a starting point for US policy on settlements. And so, um, you know, saying this is, this is the map that we envision as the future territorial arrangement after a final status agreement. Um, this is the map we're gonna use. So on this map, anything that is designated as Israel, we're fine with. Anything that is not designated as Israel, we're not fine with. Um, you know, that, that's probably the clearest approach here. It does raise you know, a, a host of complications, including the fact that, you know, we, as I said, you know, we do um, very firmly believe uh, in a negotiated solution that has to be negotiated between the two sides. And putting down a US map and saying this is what we think the map will look, you know, should look like, um, doesn't necessarily jive with that. Um, but this is an option that you know the US could pursue as a way of tackling settlements. Um, next uh, is uh, really focusing on supporting um, coexistence programs, people to people programs, um, efforts to combat incitement. Um, you know, the recent uh, Nidaloe Peace Fund that uh, they passed and, and became law that designated $250 million over five years for these types of programs is a great, a great model. It's, it's one that, you know, that, that IPF supported. I know it's something that uh, Atidniks are passionate about and, and you guys did a lot of work on, um, on lobbying on it. And you know, it's, it's, an important, it's an important effort. And so um, we wanna make sure that those types of efforts uh, you know, remain supported and, um, and frankly go beyond just the, the Nidaloe Peace Fund um, into, uh, into other areas as well. So that's, that's the bucket of uh, medium term steps, medium term steps. Um, I'll quickly, quickly run through the last bucket. As I said, probably the least interest to, to this group because it's, it's, uh, it's sort of more, more in the weeds on internal US government stuff. But um, you know, as I said before, it's basically saying, you know, we don't wanna, we don't wanna crowd out uh, every other actor. Um, and so uh, as opposed to kind of the US being, you know, being the only relevant actor here, you know, think of it more as the U.S. being the first violin in an orchestra, right? There are lots of other parties that are important here, um, from the U.N. to the Quartet to the Arab Quartet, um, to Jordan, Egypt in particular, um, to states that are normalizing relations with Israel. You know, let's kind of involve everybody who wants to be involved, and you know, we can kind of conduct the orchestra, or not even conduct. Maybe that's even too much. Um, as I said, first violin, right? We can kind of be the, the lead player, um, but don't come in and say, we're the US, this is our view, this is what we're doing, you know, the rest of you can either back it or, or, or screw yourselves, which is kind of what the US has done in the past. Um, you know, particularly since, as I said up top, you know, this is not, this is not an issue uh, or an area that is uh, gonna be the top of the Biden administration list of things to do. And so it really does make sense um, for other actors, particularly as over time, other actors have gotten more skin in the game to really uh, listen, listen and involve other actors. Um, I just, I just mentioned, you know, Jordan and Egypt. We focus on Jordan in particular, um, given that they are um, not only probably the most responsible, uh, most responsible actor in terms of Arab states, but they also, um, you know, they are a critical U.S. ally. A lot of the things that go on in the West Bank and East Jerusalem um, are destabilizing to the Jordanian government, and so, you know, we want to make it clear that the U.S. should support uh, support Jordan, but also support Jordanian efforts. Um, particularly in East Jerusalem, because they tend to be uh, a stable moderating influence. Um, and so strengthening an engagement with Jordan on this issue, uh, and also figuring out a way to use the normalization process, which we fully support, um, to also benefit the Israeli-Palestinian sphere. Um, you know, so far, obviously the Emiratis, uh, the Emiratis got a temporary halt to annexation um, as a commitment um, for normalizing relations with Israel, but, um, you know, the, the other states that have uh, that have signed on, uh, Morocco, Sudan, and Bahrain, um, haven't involved themselves on this issue at all. And so, you know, it would be helpful. We don't think that that normalization agreements should be held up until there is there is an Israeli-Palestinian agreement. But we would like to see uh, Arab states, when they are normalizing relations with Israel, a use their newfound influence with Israel to push some of the steps that we, you know, <laughs> that we talked about in, in these first two buckets um, and also use their influence with the Palestinians, you know, to get them to engage in a more productive, a more productive manner as well. Um, so, you know, that's an important, that's an important part of it. Um, and 
You know, third is to really um, within the U.S. government, instead of as I said, having kind of uh, having the the president or the secretary of state be like the action officer for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which has happened in the past, uh, and you know, instead of having a special envoy office that basically crowds out everybody else, make sure there's a real interagency process that involves state and DOD and the NSC, and that and that policy in this area is made like policy in almost every other area is made in the U.S. government, um, particularly since, as I said. You know, we don't want to focus on negotiations, and so it makes sense for there to be uh, a much more um, kind of stable, predictable, and robust interagency process. Uh, and then last, um, and then I'll, I'll stop and we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Um, you know, we are clear that we, that we think that two states is, uh, remains the only viable option. We are clear that we think two states should be the policy that the US government pursues. It is also clear to us um, that, and you know, remember I'm talking right now as a CNAS study uh, co-author, um, not, uh, not necessarily uh, as, as IPF spokesperson. Um, it is also clear to us that two states may at this point not be what actually emerges, given all of the changes that have happened on the ground in the wrong direction. Um, and so what that means from the US government perspective is that while it's important to, to unambiguously support two states, it's also important to do some prep work for what happens if, if something else actually emerges as um, kind of the dominant, uh, the dominant paradigm for this conflict. And so, um, you know, we go through a single democratic state in this report, we go through confederation, we go through, uh, we go through a, a, a single non-democratic Jewish state. And, you know, we are very clear about why we don't think that these are good options and how they would adversely affect US interests. But if you're doing policy planning for the US government, you have to outline exactly how these would affect US interests, you know, in what ways they'd be good and which, in what ways they'd be bad and what, how the US should respond. And so um, we think that it's really important for the US to do this internally, you know, not as kind of a big public thing, not as a signal that we're backing away from two states, but just as a matter of um, responsible contingency planning. So that's, um, that's the report in a nutshell. Um, uh, I guess that took me like, 40 minutes to do. Yeah, I guess there's no way I could have possibly done that in 30. That was uh, that was Pollyanna-ish. Um, so that's the point in a nutshell. As I said, I'm I'm happy to happy to answer any questions or talk about anything you guys like. Alex, oh, Alex. Have a question? Hey, Michael. Yeah, uh, thank you for what is unsurprisingly a lot of context and information and a really clear point of view. Um, your, your last point was what I was gonna ask up front, which um, is about sort of a, a different approach or a different climate for, for two states. And the tone of this meeting has been like markedly, I think a little different than, than what I've come to expect from IPF. And it's just made me curious, um, you know, the, the support on this issue, it has never been fully consistent or where we're all ready for it to be, but what is this like decided sort of tone change? Is it about undoing some of the Trump plan? Is it about appealing to like a moderate Biden administration? Is it like too much has changed in this four years that we need to just walk some of it back? Or I'm just curious the impetus for a lot of this, this thinking and positioning. Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, so I'll say at the bat that um, <laughs> It's been it's been a weird year for me because you know I, I've been kind of deep in the weeds in writing this. Um, probably took up more of my time. Actually, I'm, I'm certain it took up more of my time than anything else. Uh, you know, over you know really really since uh, two September's ago. Um, and at the same time, you know, having internal IPF uh, meetings and discussions and planning about um, sort of to what extent we're going to embrace everything in this report. Um, you know, I would, and I'd say as IPF policy director that we probably embrace somewhere between 90 and 95% of what's in here. Um, not all of it, um, but most of it. So, you know, the impetus is, you know, you listed a bunch of them, right? The Trump administration, as I said, we don't think that they're the only ones who have, who have done a poor job here. The Trump administration, you know, tried very hard to upend just the basic fundamental assumptions um, behind the conflict and how it would be resolved and how the U.S. should view it. Um, you know, let's not forget we're you know we're uh, I think actually January twenty eighth, if memory serves me correctly, will be the one year anniversary of the Trump plan release. You know that means that we're you know not even a year out 
from the US government coming out and saying, hey, we support unilateral 30% annexation of the West Bank up front, um, which is a crazy position. You know, uh, everybody here has probably heard me talk about annexation because it's really all we talked about for, <laughs> for three years. You know, it's an insane position for the US to take. Um, you know, and I haven't even talked in this, I haven't even talked tonight about that might actually not even be kind of the craziest position that the Trump administration advanced. Um, some of the things that they actually did, because annexation didn't happen, but some of the things that they actually did with regard to how the US views the West Bank, um, you know, were even more, were even more far reaching and, and kind of even more striking. So yeah, part of it is that, is that it, it's really clear that um, much, of, much of the Trump approach has to be repudiated. Um, it's also clear, as I said, that you know, the focus on negotiations, and as you know, IPF, so you know, I've been here for five and a half years, we've never pushed negotiations, we've never thought that that was a good idea at this point in time. Um, but you know, the US focus on negotiations, as I said, has allowed a, has allowed a lot of really, really bad shit to, to go down. Um, because you know, when we're trying to get the two sides together, we don't necessarily want to do anything on either side that's going to push them away. And so, you know, we haven't taken um, a terribly productive stance toward, you know, a lot of the most damaging settlements because we didn't want to have the Israelis disengage. We haven't pushed the Palestinians on PA reform or on prisoner payments, um, you know, or on really kind of figuring out a way to get back into Gaza because we don't want to scare the Palestinians away from, you know, coming to engage. So, um, you know, that's, that's been a problem too. Um, and yeah, we, we determined, you know, well before Biden was the nominee, well before, you know, while, while we were still deep in democratic primaries, um, we determined that, um, or I shouldn't even say deep in primaries, before, you know, way before primaries even, back when Elizabeth Warren was like the clear front runner back, you know, last September, two Septembers ago. You know, it was our assessment that for a whole variety of reasons, this was not going to be top of the list of any of any Democratic president. There are just too many other things to deal with. And um, you know, we that being the case, this is also not you know, something that this is not. This is not a plan for conflict management, right? We are not saying kind of just let the two parties stew in their own juices and you know we'll just kind of try to monitor things quietly from the side and you know they can just kind of beat each other to death and you know their problem not ours. That is not what we are saying. You know, we want to make sure that given a lower profile on this issue and given that we don't anticipate negotiations, that there really is a comprehensive productive plan in place to not let things go off the rails and to make it clear that we do still have a view. We do still have you know, a US vision for how this gets resolved. We do, we do still have a US vision for what should happen day to day. Um, and so, you know, yeah, in some ways this is, in some ways this is, um, I don't wanna say pessimistic, but it's certainly kind of a, 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 a hard edged, hard eyed view of things. Um, but it does take into account a number of realities that simply didn't exist one year ago, four years ago, 10 years ago. Um, and we're trying to take that into account. Does that, does that answer your question? Hey, Michael. Oh, hey, Ryan, how you doing? I'm all right, how are you? Good. Um, thank you for all this. Um, curious, uh, you presented like a, a series of options on um, and calling from LA. Um, Adam asked us to say, um, if you were if you so, were literally right around the corner at your parents' house, I'd be I'd be pissed you hadn't told me. So. Yeah, <laughs> that I hadn't knocked yet and stood ten feet away from you. Um, so, um, so curious to know. Uh, you presented all these options on on settlements and the various, you know, that that being kind of the open ended uh, section. Where where do you come down, and and where do you think? And and it kind of sounded like some of the some of those options could be used, you know, in com in some kind of combination too. Sure. So one hundred percent. I mean, I think actually all three of them, you know, could be used in combination. Um, they aren't meant to be mutually exclusive. Um, so. I'm not, you know, of of the um, of the co-authors, I am I am not the one who is the biggest proponent of the last one. I'm not sure that putting down a U.S. map is a great idea. Um, you know, I I wasn't a fan of the Trump map because of the map itself, right? Like because of because of what it actually looked like. But I'm also not sure, even had it looked different, you know, I, I'm not sure that the U.S. should be in the business. Certainly now, you know, maybe when you're like at end stage negotiations, but certainly now, 
I'm not sure the US should be in the business of putting down its own nap. Um, I definitely, I have for a long time um, have supported the idea of a, of a very clearly defined partial settlement freeze. You know, that also involves, it can't, as I said, you know, it can't just be beyond the barrier. It also can't just be saying outside the blocks because the Israelis have never defined what they view as the blocks. They've never, you know, defined the footprint of the blocks. So like it, it does involve, you know, in some ways not putting down our own map, but just saying, you know, this is, you know, these are, these are the areas that are not problematic as far as we're concerned. And like, you know, it doesn't mean just expanding the footprint of those areas either. So I, I, I am a big fan of number two. I have been for a long time. Um, and on number one, you know, I'll, I'll tell you guys candidly off the record, number one, the sort of you break it, you bought a policy, you know, that was, that was, that was my idea. Um, it depends on how it's implemented. Um, because, you know, I am extremely, I'm extremely sensitive to two things. I'm extremely sensitive, A, to just how bad a lot of UN resolutions are. And so it's important if you're going to go down that route, that it's not just sort of, you know, we're going to abstain from everything that comes before the UN with regards to Israel. That, that cannot be the policy. Um, and I'm also sensitive to the fact that in some ways, the Israel, this freaks out the Israelis, the Israeli government more than anything else. Um, I'm fairly certain that if you gave any Israeli prime minister a choice, um, the US either cuts off all security assistance to Israel or the US uh, abstains from every single resolution related to Israel and the UN, they would probably choose A before they would choose B. Um, you know, and so that also, so it makes it a very effective tool if you're saying, you know, don't count on an automatic veto. And by the way, I'll point out, you know, it may sound radical, but um, the Trump administration is uh, the first administration to never have uh, abstained or even voted yes on uh, a resolution targeting Israel at the UN. Every single other administration, including George W. Bush, including Ronald Reagan, um, let some of these resolutions um, go through because they contradicted US policy. So in a lot of ways, this is actually just a return to status quo ante. Um, but, you know, the Israelis are super sensitive to it. Um, it creates a big problem within Israeli politics because of how they reacted to, to Resolution 2334 uh, in December 2016. You know, it also kind of raises questions now for the Israeli government that it never did before about you know whether we sort of how we treat how we treat Israel as an ally. And so, you know, if you go with option number one, it has to be done in a in a really careful manner um, and done in a way that stresses that. Israel is absolutely a U.S. ally. We absolutely view, you know, view it as our role to protect and safeguard our allies. Um, that you know, we're not out, we're, we're not looking for uh, Israel to kind of bear the brunt of sanctions in international institutions. But again, if we have a very clear policy and Israel says we disagree, it's their right to disagree. But we don't need to be, we, we don't need to be undermining ourselves by then supporting their policy to contradict our own. So. Um, I'm all in for I'm all in for option number two, um, and I think option number one is a good idea depending on how it's structured. And and just a, a quick follow up on option number two is there is there a is there a stick there I mean is there is you know is there consequences I mean that you imagine that you envision you know if they if you were to present a partial settlement freeze and, yeah sure you know, so I, we I actually, feel like we've been down that road and, and yeah you know. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a great question. So, you know, we are obviously very sensitive to the idea of, of carrots and sticks. Uh, the Trump administration didn't believe in sticks when it came to Israel. Um, we actually have a uh, we have a kind of a a two page um, two pages in the report where um, we list also a bunch of different options, uh, none of which we necessarily you know endorse or don't endorse. But although some of them we actually in this section go out of our way to say that we don't think it's a good idea, but we basically lay out all the options we think exist for the US to induce uh, Israeli policy changes. Um, you know, and they range from engaging in public public or private praise or criticism, you know, which administrations have done, um, to examining kind of engagement, you know, particularly with Prime Minister Netanyahu, um, Oval Office visits um, and visits of, you know, uh, high ranking American officials from the president on down to Israel um, are kind of a big deal. You know, they, Israeli prime ministers use them to help themselves out politically. Um, you know, kind of holding back on those or, or sending lower level officials to Israel 
you know, as a way to kind of make a statement, you know, that's an option. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I talked about kind of changing U.S. posture in, in international institutions. Um, there is this idea of conditioning security assistance. That's something that um, IPF absolutely does not support. And we kind of go out of our way, even though we list these as different options, we go out of our way in that, in that kind of section uh, to sort of reiterate why we don't think that'll be effective or a good idea, but it is an option. Um, and then there are kind of positive inducements, you know, the, the carrots, which are um, deepening security cooperation. Um, one of the things we wrote in here was uh, including Israel in more, uh, in more CENTCOM activities. Um, you know, in, in the waiting days of the Trump administration, Israel was actually moved out of UCOM and to, and to CENTCOM, which I think is a good idea. Um, you know, we talk about, um, uh, we talk about integrating Israel into kind of other uh, regional security arrangements. We talk about deepening strategic dialogues with Israel, more joint training exercises, increasing the amount of equipment we sell them. Uh, and we also talk about um, greater, pushing for greater international recognition for Israel as a Jewish state, something that, um, that actually has never been um, stated US policy. You know, presidents have talked about, um, uh, presidents have talked about, you know, the importance of Israel as Jewish and democratic, but it's never actually been US policy to say we support Israel, you know, Dafka as a Jewish state, and we've never really worked to kind of get others on board with that. So you know, that's another carrot we can use, assuming that Israel kind of, you know, goes along with some of the things we're asking. So a whole range of ways to try to try to get is, Israeli behavior um, to shift in ways that you know we'd like to see it shift. Some are some are carrots, some are sticks, and and you know they're to different they're they're to varying degrees. Um, but there there is a whole range of options that you know in the U.S. toolbox that we can use. Thanks, Michael. I think we can take one, maybe one speed round if that's okay. And if there are some handful of questions left, Michael. So you wanna just raise your hand if you have a question and I'll quickly say, uh, looks like we'll go uh, Rachel and Jonah. And then uh, for folks who wanna stay on, it would be nice to do some breakout rooms just for 10 or so minutes. So let's hear Rachel and then Jonah and then, uh, and then we'll wrap uh, into the next portion. My question is actually pretty short because it's very in the weeds. Uh, I was really intrigued by the suggestion of having a universal welfare system put into place to replace the prison payment system that's currently in place. It seems almost elegantly simple and would actually resolve a lot of issues, not just that initial issue. So I'm curious, what are the barriers to doing something like that? Is it distribution? Is it funding? Is it, I guess, government itself? Like what are actually the physical or I guess, logistical issues with doing that. Um, Adam, do you want me to answer that quickly or do you want, should we take a... Let's go to Jonah and David Harari also, and we'll see how, how your memory is, Michael. It's usually pretty good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, for your presentation. Uh, my question has to do with uh, some of those medium term steps. Like you said, like, hastening into a two-state solution right now isn't realistic and whatever Israeli government comes next probably won't have the political will to go that far anyway. But I think I've heard you say that there are some members in the Knesset, even right wing, who will agree to maybe some concrete steps of separation, maybe the ones you were alluding to, like giving the Palestinians more control and contingency between areas B and C. So I'm wondering if you could like uh, uh, give us some insight on maybe some uh, members of the Knesset you've spoken to who may not say they support a two-state solution, but based on your conversations, have said they may support some of the policies that you suggest in the report. Thank you. Go for David. You're good, David. Hi, Michael. Your report cites the Lowy Act and people-to-people -people partnerships being a right step forward. How do you think the $250 million aid package will be to help Build long-term foundation for security for Israelis and Palestinians. Thanks. Okay, so um, Rachel, on, on Palestinian prisoner payments. Yes, the obvious way to do this is to create a social welfare system um, for all Palestinians. Some of the problems. Um, a, the Palestinians, you know, as I said before, Palestinian governance is, is awful. Um, and so, you know, there's a question whether they actually have the capacity to, to get a system up and running like that, um, you know, certainly quickly. Um, B, there's gonna be a resistance on the Palestinian side uh, politically um, within Palestinian society, just given 
uh, given the role that prisoners play, um, you know, they are sort of the, you know, literally kind of the, the top of the heap uh, of Palestinian society. And um, there's going to be pushback at this sense that prisoners uh, are not going to be treated, you know, kind of extra special, right? That they're just part of a general welfare system. Um, and as they see, on the Israeli side, and probably um, here too, uh, you know, in, in uh, Republican circles in Congress, there's going to be a position that says, you know, if any, if the family of any prisoner or any martyr family gets even, you know, one, gets even 10 agarot, then, you know, that's too much, right? That they shouldn't be getting anything. Even if you create a social welfare system, they should be barred from it. Um, and so that's, you know, that's going to be a problem too. Um, and I think that from a U.S. perspective, it's going to be important to figure out what is acceptable uh, in terms of you know, U.S. policy and then evaluating what the Palestinians do based on that and then saying, you know, there may be Israeli injections, there may be Palestinian injections, but this is sort of what we need. And, you know, if, if we see it meeting our standards, you know, then, then we're prepared to make changes in U.S. legislation, recognizing that, you know, there has been real reform. So I think those are probably the biggest, the biggest hurdles. Um, Jonah on, uh, on the question um, about uh, folks in the Knesset. So, you know, someone like Yair Lapid, who isn't really out there talking about two states, you know, someone like him supports a lot of these measures. Uh, in the past, Avigdor Lieberman has supported um, some, of the, some of the steps to make, things, uh, to make things a little better in the West Bank. Um, when Bogi Alon was defense minister, he was also in favor of some of this stuff. Um, particularly, you know, when it comes to um, giving Palestinians uh, kind of better autonomy, a little, a little more freedom of movement in Area B. Um, unfortunately, in Area C, which is where th these things are the most important, you know, that's where the temperature has been raised over the last few years. If you've kind of paid attention to right-wing folks in the Knesset, um, particularly someone like Tfi Hauser, who uh, is coming off a stint chairing the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, his kind of pet issue was talking about um, the Palestinian war to, to conquer Area C. And so, you know, one of the reasons that like permits and demolitions have, have gotten even worse um, is because there's this, there's this idea out there in Israeli right wing circles that the Palestinians are trying to take over Area C and we have to defend Area C. Um, so, you know, these things which were, which, you know, some of them, which as you know, IPF has been talking about for five years, you know, they were hard five years ago, some of them are even harder now, particularly with regard to the DREC issues. Um, so there is still, you know, some constituency for it uh, in, inside of kind of the centrist and, you know, right of center Israeli circles, but unfortunately at the moment, not a whole lot. Um, David, on the question about uh, the, the Needle Lowy Fund. Um, so, you know, the way this relates to security, I think, um, you know, in my view is that, Obviously, you can put security arrangements in place, you know, that deal with uh, the IDF and PA security forces and, and, you know, border arrangements and, and checkpoints and smart fences and whatever else it is. Um, at the end of the day, as we all know, um, even with a, you know, separation and a two-state outcome, Israelis and Palestinians are still going to be very intertwined, right? Their economies are going to be intertwined. They're still going to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians coming to Israel every day to work. You can have Israelis who want to go uh, visit sites in the West Bank. Um, you're, you know, depending on how things work out, you may even have Israelis living in the West Bank, you know, in the state of Palestine. Um, if there is not basic people-to-people -people programming and basic acceptance of each other, at just you know, at a, at a basic human level, um, you're never going to have real security. Um, you, know, you you cannot have these two peoples who, even if they do separate and have two states, are still living side by side and sharing a very small piece of land, um, you're never going to have anything approaching real, fundamental, personal, ongoing, day-to-day -day security without fostering connection between peoples and without fostering greater understanding uh, on both sides of the other side's narrative and, and kind of making sure that um, Palestinians and Israelis see each other and encounter each other and view each other as humans and not just as, you know, the monsters who live on the other side of the, the separation barrier. Um, so, you know, while, while things like the, the Lowy uh, Peace Fund, you know, they're not, they're, not, they're not conceived of or talked about um, or framed as security measures, 100% um, they're absolutely critical uh, to, to long-term security on both sides. 
Wow. Pretty good, Michael. As always, I'm right. impressed. And uh, uh, <laughs> we can do this again. Thanks, Adam. Uh, thanks, everyone. Great, great to see all of you. Um, if anybody has any other questions that I didn't answer or anybody wants to, you know, chat about the report, uh, chat about the report more, um, I'm always happy to talk to, uh, to any and all of you. Um, so uh, thanks, guys, and enjoy, enjoy the rest of your evening. Great. There's a couple uh, final notes from me and then for folks who do want to stick around just for a couple more minutes to kind of have some human connections, we're happy to use this as a platform to do that. Uh, especially because we have some new faces here, including some new new steering committee members. But um, this webinar tonight uh, did serve to also actually culminate what we called our 2020 About IPF Policy Series, which was uh, designed for steering committee leaders in IPF IT chapters and specifically our new, new chapters in San Francisco and Boston. So we'll be uploading this recording to that private web page that um, is joined by the other parts of the series. And as a reminder, we're, we're, we're gonna be continuing to put on programs like this for this new report for our community. And so um, always be in touch if you think this is a, a discussion that should meet new, new audiences. And kind of in that vein, we spent a lot of last year doing a lot of listening to our community, listening to our IPF fatigue leader, leaders through our survey and focus groups. And we're really looking forward to announcing new ideas for our work uh, that we've been working on. And so those are some a couple weeks, some a couple months away, uh, but to give you, to, to peel the curtain back a little bit of what we've been working on with the National Council, we have a new Powered by IPF ATEED fund uh, that will help provide funding for ATEEDNIC leaders to put on programs uh, for your communities that are a bit more lay leader driven, uh, similar to what we do with our Charles Bronfman conveners, but looking to extend that uh, to all of our ATEED leaders. Uh, we're also considering a new Hevruta Connections networking program initiative, which will, uh, again, help people network with other young professionals across our community, because we really do think we're, we're lucky to have so many really cool, impressive young professionals from all corners of North America. Um, those are just a couple tastes of, of what's to come. Um, and so we're looking forward to, to when we can announce those and also potential opportunities to be thought partners for us as we kind of pilot new ideas. Um, but that's hopefully was a quick rundown. Um, and uh, I think we're gonna go into some breakouts in groups of two or three. If you'd like to say hi, we, we really don't have much structure for it. Just if you'd like to debrief what you heard, really just say hi, make it uh, we've been We've been doing Zoom schmoozes, so. Uh, there's a handful of us left, so maybe we'll do a couple groups and uh, we'll see you guys later.